You're my patient, you've seen this before, which is the endothelium, this big long tube. And oftentimes I'll use my hands or I'll use this water bottle or a cup that I'm drinking a, like some coffee out of. But this is the vasculature. And the inner lining of the vasculature is called the endothelium. And an endotheliitis is an inflama inflammation of, of that. And so we now know that the endothelium is like many tissues, it expresses ACE2. So there are more than 70 different types of tissue in the body. So lung tissue, testes, blood cells, uh, endothelium that express ACE2. And that means that the virus, SARS-CoV-2, can get in there. And so I wanted to, to make sure everyone was aware, this little kind of like turquoise green thing, that's spike protein. That's how I'm representing spike protein. So this is making spike protein. And it can be found in the blood of long COVID patients. So I'm inside the tube, I'm in here, and I can see spike protein floating around. So I know this, this is another article, this came out of Harvard University, they use an assay called the Samoa assay. And the Samoa assay was able to identify, um, uh, uh, I've seen that uh, uh, Eddie has a quick question here and I'll get to that, um, which is, that there might be free-floating spike in, in long COVID patients. So they were able to detect it in 60% of patients. It did kind of go up and down. Like you look at the time course and there was spike and then it went away and it came back. And that could be for many reasons. Maybe we're getting reinfected or maybe the virus is there and it's just creating spike protein kind of willy-nilly. But it was important to know because we know that there's spike there. Okay. So there's one mechanism that I wanted to make sure. Um, for so uh, I, I will get to Eddie B's question um, to talk about endotheliitis. Um, but kind of moving forward, I wanted to talk about what then happens. So you get a, a an attack of immune cells. So I'm, I'm calling a white blood cell this little circle here. So the white blood cell then goes up to the spike protein because that's a foreigner. I don't I don't want you, and it will gobble it up. And what it does is it presents it on its surface and it says, hey, I got something inside of me that the body needs to know about. And then that will tell a T cell that something's happening and we should may tell the B cell to make an antibody. But in this case, I'm going down this one theory. And this is a theory that I've used on a few patients. It doesn't work on everyone, um, but that this is a monocyte, a non-classical monocyte that contains spike protein. And it is releasing inflammatory molecules and results in an inflammation of the area around it. That's one theory. So let's get our, our antibody in. So that's what they're kind of shaped like. They're shaped like Ys. And um, these actually will attack spike protein because that's what, what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to bind up. So I wanted to mention this because there are several different mechanisms of what could be going on in terms of the endotheliitis. And so here we've got this inflammatory monocyte that's causing little damage to the inner lining of the vasculature. But it might not just be that monocyte. It might be free-floating spike that's just running into the endothelium causing damage. It might be immune complexes. So immune complexes are one an antigen, like a virus particle or whatever, binds with, with an antibody and it floats down through the blood and it gets stuck in the walls of the arteries. Or maybe it's an autoantibody and it's attacking the tissues or just causing general inflammation. But it's just important for my patients to understand that that process is going on. And I think that the endotheliitis is a big deal. So we've got this right here. We've got the endotheliitis. How do we test for that? So there's several different ways that we can think about endotheliitis. So this is Eddie B's question here. One of them is called the endopat test. So the endopat test is being used by a lot of the researchers in the recover trials. So recover trials, again, that's the $1.2 billion that the federal government is giving to long COVID researchers. I've had a handful of patients use the endopat test. The hard thing about the endopat test is that it's expensive and hard to come by. I've called many, many different clinics all around the country to try to find this. If anyone has found it, we are trying to put a database together of where this location is, but essentially it will detect endothelial damage. We can look at cytokine levels. We can uh, look at something called HSCRP, which is high sensitivity CRP, which as an internal medicine doc, I used to use in my patients who would have heart attacks to tell me, hey, is there inflammation going on in the coronary arteries? And then something called VEGF, uh, which might be high in certain patients telling me, huh, there's vascular inflammation going on. So I wanted to kind of you know, say, there are many markers of 
endothelial damage. And it's important, and why I harp on this is because of this patient, of this, of this article that came out of Canada in October 22, where they were able to say ANG1 and P-selectin are great markers for vascular inflammation. Okay, and this is what the group of patients look like. They look like long COVID patients. They had headaches and fevers and coughs and chest pain and diarrhea. And so it really ran the spectrum of long COVID patients, but they were able to diagnose long COVID using two vascular markers. And I'm noting from what Dr. Pretorius and Dr. Kell and Dr. Lobschner are saying is, I'm treating this with microclotting theory and even diarrhea and insomnia are going away. So is this an underlying fundamental cause of long COVID? So moving on, we have the endotheliitis and I think about what are other drugs that I can use for this? So there was a great nature paper that came out in around September of 2022 that talked about it. And I've used all of these medicines to help people. Statins have helped people. Metformin, there's a lot of talk on Twitter right now about using that as a drug. I'm not sure how effective it is, but I really want us to be able to mine our data to look to see. Um, Phenofibrate, I've, I've known a few docs that have used that and it's been helpful for, for, for a few patients. Um, vitamin C, lots of long COVID patients are on that. Um, Nextatol, uh, hard to get, but potentially a treatment. Fish oil, I've had a few patients come to me and say, Really, fish oil is the only thing that's helped me. Um, Pycnogenol, this comes from the pine bark. Uh, it's a pine bark supplement. It's published in Nature. Um, and I've had a handful of patients say, this has really, really helped me. Um, Arterazole is another medicine. And I got to tell everyone, um, these aren't medicines that I, that I really had heard of. Uh, you know, half of them I hadn't heard of before becoming a long COVID doctor. And so it's just really important to, to remain open-minded, but also to listen and to look. And people will say, oh, have you heard about this drug? I will be the first person to say, no, I've never heard of that one. Let's give it a try. I will read more about it because these things are helping people. So there are lots of other ones. And the theory is that maybe it's helping the endothelium. And so one thing I wanted to bring up is if I'm having these nicks in the endothelium, are, is this a nidus for clotting to happen? Is that where the microclotting is happening? And we get these kind of piling on of little of platelets. So the little red circles here are platelets in this case. And so the other thing I wanted to bring up is we know from, from, from data that's published is that the platelets will bind spike. And these can result in these horrible microclots. And so I stole this from one of uh, Risa Pretorius's papers, which is this, this insoluble kind of plaque plus clot that are in the blood of long COVID patients. And so there are several mechanisms of what, what might be going on to cause endothelial damage. Is it from spike? Is it from monocytes? Is it from antibody complex? Is it from inflammation? Is it from these complexes? And that's really what I wanted to underline to folks, to my patients, is that concept of, I do think that there is an endothelial microclotting damage going on. Do we know exactly where it's coming from? No. How can we approach this? And how do we make sure that our patients understand what we can do? So with the microclotting, we can send microclotting tests. So at Rhythm, we've been sending a whole bunch of microclotting tests on people. And we actually now send it as the first set of lab tests on people. And we are trying to mine that data to tell us, is there something that we can easily test for? So for example, the Canadian study out of Ontario that showed ANG1 and P-selectin. I remember when that study came out and I got on the phone and I called Sigma Aldrich, which is the company that makes that. And I said, hey, you know, can I get this, this, this thing, this test for my patients? And they said, right now, this is only, you know, a, a scientific test. We can't use it in the lab. I am sure there are lots of people who are trying to fight and to find that test and make that test for people. But are there current tests that we can use to figure out what's going on here? Okay. And so we think we found a few of them, but we're not sure. And we're, we're continuing to look. So in line with that, we would start people on a variety of medications to eliminate the microclotting. So again, healing the endothelium, healing the microclotting. So what Rizu Pretorius and Doug Kell and all of them did is they, you use triple therapy, which is 
uh, aspirin and clopidogrel. Those are two antiplatelet medicines that affect the platelet in, a, uh, in two different ways, so kind of like a double whammy. Um, and then we can also use blood thinners. And so there are natural blood thinners. And so I saw a really great lecture with Dr. Uh, Lobschner where he says, you know, if you can't get on blood thinners, natokinase, lumbrokinase, serapeptidase, great options for patients. And again, I want to underline, before I became a long COVID doctor, did I know what these were? No. And it is really from my patients that I've learned a lot of this and looking and reading and, and, and taking help from them. I put a little star beside the natokinase because I want to come back to that one. But a part of this is also Eloquis. And Eloquis is a blood thinner that I've used as a doctor um, for various uh, kind of issues, um, but is a part of this whole process. Okay, so the thing that I wanted to come back to is really this concept of the upstream process. Hey, we've got microclotting going on. We've got endothelial damage. And is the endothelial damage causing the microclotting? Is the microclotting this independent thing? But what's causing all of that in the first place? And so right here, I have the spike protein. Is that what's causing it? Doing a little big question mark here. Um, so that's a really important question. And so 